All right. Uh, so, can you start by telling me a little bit about yourself, about where you were born, uh, about your parents, family growing up, just a little bit? I was born in the home of Les Paul, Waukesha, Wisconsin. August 12, 1949. Uh, my mom and dad were from Waukesha County, which was all rural back then. Milwaukee's almost spread out that far now. Um, they went to Heartland High School. My mom was from North Lake. My dad was from Heartland. My mother's whole, whole side, both sides of her family are Irish. My dad, both sides were German. They were children of the Depression. And when I came along, my dad had just got, he was a combat veteran in World War II in the Navy. And then he met my ma. And eventually they had me. My dad was working for the railroad, the Milwaukee Road, but he got, the layoffs got too much. We were living on a little shack practically with outdoor plumbing on Moose Lake in Waukesha County. Um, I remember, I can remember back to almost, well I can remember back to my crib days. I got a great memory for that. No memory for numbers. <laughs> um, no, that's great. Uh, you, so, wait, I'm, I'm getting there. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. I love living on this lake. I was always, I've always been a water creature. I just loved it out there because it was all, you know, trees, green, the lake. We had a little rowboat, a little pier. And then when I was five, we moved to Milwaukee so my dad could get steady work at a Ford shop in Cudahy, south side of Milwaukee. I was shocked to move to flat Milwaukee with no trees in a big city. Hated it. And I was raised Catholic, which was traumatic. I lived next to the school and church, so I was there all the time. That was when there was still Latin rites. However, my dad always had the radio on. He always loved music. And my ma, he could play a little piano, and I guess he played some, he played drums in the marching band in high school, so he had some ability. He never, he lacked confidence. My pa was kind of insecure. He's a quiet guy. My ma, loud and a lot in a riot, and she was the jitterbug queen of Waukesha County. My ma loved to dance. She also loved to sing. She had the worst voice in the world, couldn't hold a note, but she sang all the time. It was <laughs> terrible. Um, so, always, and then in Milwaukee, because everybody was Catholic on the south side, all the Polish, we had the Friday night fish fries, and me and my sister, when we were like three, four, I mean five, six, and get dragged off, you'd have to sit at all these taverns, family taverns all over. All had this back room for the, the family room. And kids would sit around the tables with the fish fry. Parents would sit at the bar, but the jukeboxes were always on. Un unless there was some old guy playing an accordion. So I literally heard rock and roll from the beginning. From 1954, say. I remember the first song I ever heard on the radio was, uh, that I can remember was, when the moon hits your I like the big feet. But I couldn't speak English yet, but I could understand it. That was Dean Martin. My mom loved Dean Martin. I remember love and marriage. Uh, then all of a sudden, rock, this rock and roll thing. I, I was there, man. You know, I heard it. And by falling asleep on them tables next to the jukebox with that bass, Reverb, you know, you could, you could feel a bass kind of, so like when I'm six years, seven years old, I already know 12 bar structures, just like automatically, they're going to do one part, they're going to do another part, then they're going to do a middle part that's going to be different, then they're going to do the other part, then the song's over, because, so I sort of had theory like that, you know, and I could keep a beat. And then, then rock and roll got 
I remember I really liked Hound Dog and Elvis's early stuff. Then it got all sappy for a while. I did like doo-wop, a lot of the coaster stuff, Charlie Brown and Get a Job and all that. And then in, in 1962, my buddy, we were in sixth grade, he says, I'm getting an electric guitar for, my, for Christmas. I want to start a band. So, well, of course, I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm the drummer. <laughs> Just because my dad had sticks. I didn't know what I was doing. And the steel strike in 1961 was on at the time, so my dad was laid off. We were, we were on going down to welfare for food and stuff. I had, there was five of us. And I asked my dad for drums for Christmas, and somehow he managed to get a, a old bass, an old Slingerland bass, a snare, a pedal, and one little cymbal. But I had drums. I'm in the band. We didn't, none of us knew what we were doing. We had like four accordion players, because that's in Milwaukee, just on the south side, selling you accordions to keep. I think to keep Italy from going communist, we bought every accordion they ever made. <laughs> no matter what you signed up for, they'd start you on accordion. Well, you can learn your notes on accordion. Nobody wants. But so we got all these, we're doing this. But for like two years with these guys, and then another guy got a guitar, and so we're strumming these, and then trying to play like Ventures surf music, little tune, ding, 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 ding. And I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm faking it just to be in the band. And then we heard, finally get the ninth grade, hear these rumors about Beatles. What are Beatles? Who are the Beatles? Everybody's talking about the Beatles. We didn't, who the, you know. And it was a Friday, come out of school, this kid turns on his Trans, we're waiting for the bus, turns on this transistor radio, and She Loves You came on for the first time we ever heard it. And we all went just nuts, you know. Listen to this. That was so different. And, and then all of a sudden, there's Beatles all over the radio, and we're just loving it, everything we're hearing, you know. Then they're on Ed, they, on Ed Sullivan. I had a whole bunch of people over at my ma's house. We were all watching for the Beatles, my whole family, everybody. There must have been 30 people in that living room. They were supposed to be at, a, at the church for a CYO meeting after a toboggan party. And I says, no, we're going to be at my house watching the Beatles. The priest got mad at me. I, I was antichrist right then, you know. I said, come to my house. You're all invited. The Beatles come on. Everybody's just, you know, black and white, come out singing all my loving. Second set later in the show, they're doing I Want to Hold Your Hand. And they had a shot of Ringo from the back at the bridge. Like shooting up at him from, from behind. I could see his feet and his hands. And it was during the bridge. And when I touch you, I feel happy inside. And, ding, 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 ding. and then they pulled away to the front shot. That was, was that 15 seconds? And that was 15 seconds. I swear as I'm alive, I had this golden, I went just, that was an epiphany. I learned how to play drums in 15 seconds. I said, that's what I got to do. That's what I got to do because I was too proud to ask, too poor for lessons. At the guys are looking at me, what are you talking about? I said, I know what I gotta do now, I, I know what I gotta do. The next rehearsal, now we're like 14. These guys are, what the hell happened to you? I, I said, man, no. So then, from then on, I just started listening really carefully to what drummers were doing, which I never did before because I was so intrigued always with guitar sounds. I just loved guitars all my life. And then, you know, oh, Charlie Watts, yeah. Oh, this, and then they started copying Phil's. And then it just gets automatic, you know. So I've been drumming ever since, just off those 15 seconds of lessons. And then things, you know, the, the band 
got to be really good in high school. We were playing at a CYO Catholic Youth Organization. Every Friday, dances, uh, basketball game after at the high schools. I thought, and we were pretty good by then. At an organ, bass, two guitars, me also singing and playing drums. And I, I thought those guys were in it like me. You just, this is what we're going to do forever, right? I mean, what else is there? You know, we're popular, the girls are coming after us, and it's just cooler than shit. And all those new tunes kept coming out, and we were keeping up with some of the current stuff. And man, graduation comes, psh, they're gone. They, they just. One went to college, one went to build garages with his dad, one went to clean rugs with his dad. What about the band? Well, you know, like we grew up now, we don't do that no more. I was shattered. Right. I was, that's, because I wasn't doing nothing in high school, paying attention to nothing. I'm a rock and roll drummer. I'm good. I'm, you know, <laughs> it's just going to go on forever. That's when I started going bad. That, did you see it as a hippie thing yet? Hippie at that wasn't point? out yet. It was rock and roll, right? It was no hippie. Is that yet. It was rock and roll to you. Yeah. No. That was my next question. Um, I'm sorry if I talk too much. No, I'm no, you, you can edit out. Right? Yeah, no, you're giving me gold. Like I, I'm not about to slow you down, but that's one of the important ones. Was so. What was your first memory? <laughs> Yeah, so, so Richard, you, you've told me that in the beginning you guys didn't use the word hippie, but you used, the, was it was it freak? That or? wasn't even a thing yet. Right, so what, what was your first memory of anything that you would describe as hippie? Okay, when the Beatles come out in the Stones, prior to that, in high school, in the, it's all through the 50s and into the early 60s, you were a greaser in Milwaukee, or, or what they call a, a college. Collegians wore little French crew cuts, Madras shirts, white Levi's, and penny loafers. They were the one good guys. The greasers were still with the greased hair, the cigarette pack, and the t-shirt, the tough guys. All blue collar. I was one of them guys. Now rock and roll was just rock, was originally just teenage dance music. They thought it was a fad. You know, you had Dick Clark with the American Bandstand, and oh, it's got a good beat. You can dance to it. You know, and, you got all, and then all those girl groups and that shit. You know, there was no hippie. There were we knew there were beatniks someplace, but our parents, oh, they're weird. You know, and they smoke. Don't white people were not smoking weed yet. This is important in the Midwest. There was. Maybe those colored people did it, that's what back then, you know, but not, white kids on the south side of Milwaukee, there was no marijuana when I was in high school at all. Until my senior year, junior, senior, senior, for what it's worth, by Buffalo Springfield I actually hit the radio. It's the first thing that sounded different to me and somebody mentioned the word psychedelic. And we had no clue, you know. We're still, we're still playing old Buddy Holly tunes and just Wooly Bully, 96 Tears, Midnight Hour, that, you know, just, just dance, rock and roll. No, no jams. We played them exactly like the record. You didn't. Your good bands back then it was how close you played to the record. If a solo was this long, you played it exactly, and that was it. There was no stretching, no jamming. Hippie, we didn't know anything about. And then all of a sudden we heard more about this psychedelic. What is that? Well, there's these people, they, they, they're psychedelic. Well, what does that mean? We didn't even hear about acid yet. We didn't know what nothing. All of a sudden, though, because it's spreading. Now the, the Stones and the Beatles all of a sudden, they're changing. We don't know why, but it's, they're starting to smoke. We don't know they're smoking weed and shit, you know? Rubber Soul comes out, it sounds different. Then Revolver, Sergeant Pepper by then, we knew what was going on. These 
like Life Magazine all of a sudden, back then the big photo mag that came out every week, had this thing on hippies and hate Ashbury in San Francisco. And we're looking, holy shit. Now, Brian Jones in the, was setting the, this fashion thing in England with the ruffles and the velvets and shit. He was the coolest. We thought Brian Jones was the fucking coolest thing going, right? We're kids. We're, and he was the guy. And the stones are changing too. Their music's getting, we don't know quite why yet. Then all of a sudden we hear about this hippie thing and these these hippie bands and we start hearing this term hippie, hippie. What? Well then we seen what they were dressing like, hey these you can wear anything you want. You can go nuts. You can dress like Indians. You can dress like it's Halloween every day. And then these these names, you know, Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, Big Brother and the Holding Company. Who are these? Look at everybody. Everybody's got hair. It's okay. So at first you think it's just like a—is it just another fashion thing? Is it just another change in the music? But no. Then we start hearing like uh, the guy from Harvard, you know, Timothy Leary, saying about acid. Tune in, turn on, drop out, and all that shit. You know, some guy, hey, look at this, I got, what's that? Weed, I didn't even smoke cigarettes. And my 17 is finally smoked some weed. Well, that's different, because we were all drunks already by then in Milwaukee. We just, we grew up on Pabst Blue Ribbon, man. And then our parents didn't want us to go up to the east side where there were hippies, supposedly. They'd, my mom would buy us, we were all underage, she'd buy us beer to keep us from doing drugs. <laughs> and eventually, well, we were all disgusted. Should we take this shit or not? And the south side guys I grew up with, they were, no, no, that's, that's drugs, you know. Then Paul McCartney, in the interview, Paul McCartney said he did acid and he found it so beneficial. Now, if John Lennon would have said it, it might have been sketchy, you know. But if Paul's gonna <laughs> says it's okay, fuck it. If he can handle it, I can handle it. Because we always thought Paul was, uh, you know, he was least popular with us guys. And then, it, then the, the Stones get busted a couple times in a row all of a sudden for... That acid bust at Keith's house, and uh, they busted Brian three times in a row, and trying to put Mick and Keith in jail and shit. Oh, there's more to it. Well, eventually, I was the first one of the bunch to do acid in a controlled situation, and it was the best when we found out. And all hippie just all of a sudden blossomed in 19 in Milwaukee in '67, right? '66, '67, poof. We have Brady and Farwell on the east side, just down from UW, Milwaukee, along the lakefront. All of a sudden, all of a, just like magic, poof. There's leather shops, there's head shops. The first head shop we walked into, whoa, with black lights and posters, MCS your posters and all this shit. Hey, we don't have to be a hood or a collegiate. We could be, we're us. All of a sudden it's dawning on us with this shit and we're looking at the world all new again, you know, and people are actually walking around barefoot with flowers in our hair and stuff. It was, the first couple of years was really amazing. Of course, you left that little enclave, go back to the south side, you get your ass kicked regularly, you know. <laughs> and then you had, to, of course, you had the Vietnam War and the draft going on at the same time. But before Hippie got politicized, then Sergeant Peppers came out, and then Jimi Hendrix, or two months later, and then we got, then you, then we got it. Then, we, okay, these are guys doing acid music for acid heads, and it's fantastic, you know. And then the better players start getting into Buffalo Springfield was a huge influence on American bands, and and the Stones were the beggars banquet in that. Gym. 
satanic majesty, some of the sounds, you know, the sounds, we're just digging these sounds that were never recorded before, you know, it's, this is an Elvis singing, rock, a hula baby, rock, you know, and Within You, Without You by George Harrison is what turned me to Eastern religion, and I'm still there. That sitar music, the first time I heard that sounded so familiar. It should have sounded, it sounded weird to everybody else. To me, it was like I was back home or something. I, I just linked to that. Yeah, so I think you told me that you saw Jimi Hendrix perform in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Round one was that, or? Well, the first, the first big band I saw was the Rolling Stones in Milwaukee. Was that with Brian Jones, or? Mm-hmm. Paid six dollars to see him. <laughs> um, I got a... That was just amazing. The girls were still screaming like in Beatlemania, so you couldn't really hear it too much. But there they were. Brian Jones came out with his brand new Gibson Firebird, and I almost died, you know. He looked just like the picture. It was so cool. Uh, we saw Eric Burden and the animals. Who are on a double bill with <laughs> Herman's Hermits? We had to sit through that. Jimi Hendrix, the first time in Milwaukee, was playing at a club called The Scene. We were too young to get into the bars, but they had the back doors open because it was summertime. This is his first tour. He's still playing bars. They were so loud that we were just standing in the alley digging it. It was just like you were inside, you know. Two years later, we were old enough. For Saw Hendrix on his last time around at the Milwaukee Auditorium. Saw Dylan, saw Zeppelin on their first and third tours. Saw them when they, nobody knew who they were. And the hippie thing was just, it seemed, was Sly and the Family Stone with, with this blend of blacks and whites and males and females, that band singing everyday people. That, it was like, yeah. We can all come together, you know, and, and Woodstock happened and all that shit. And, but then, you know, in America, of course, Madison Avenue's going to get a hold of it and start marketing hippie. Then it became a fashion thing to, to the rest, you know. Then all of a sudden it's okay to wear bell bottoms and some fringes. And all of a sudden you got all these weekend hippies and it becomes a fashion. Then you get these stupid shows on television, the Partridge Family, the Monkeys, and all that crap, you know, and, and they just co-opted the hippie look a lot. And then the politicals come in, and Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, and them guys, and because the mood was right because of the draft, they started with the political crap. Then, then, then it started getting ugly. And I just knew it couldn't last as cool as those first couple of years because there was a vibe in the air. You actually felt it. You seen it, and you're looking at things different. I mean, all of a sudden you're noticing the sky, or you're noticing dew in the morning. It, it, every, you know, it's shit that you just overlook. You just. But but do you think that uh, that real hippie vibe that you're talking about? Um that caused people to be better people without considering politics? Is that kind of how when you it started, are getting yeah, at? When all this free love didn't mean, hey, we're all going to take our clothes off and jump in a ditch and do it. You know, free love meant it was more like the altruistic, love your brother, help the guy, you know, feed each other, let's take care of each other, you know. And all. But it was something different than politics. You're saying that was different. Yeah, it was a, a, a life philosophy. We turn our back on the society, American society as it is, just say screw you, turn our back on it. We shut the televisions off. We did not watch TV. We just listened to tunes, music, grooving, being cool, trying. But you try to do that in America for too long. It's not you know sooner or later somebody's going to have to get a job. I have, I, oh no, one, one question about that quick. I have noticed that you have got a big American flag in your memorabilia connection, uh, collection, and sometimes you wear American flag pants and stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of what I'm wondering. Like, we, uh, did, we, we did that shit just to piss people off back then, more or less. It yeah. Was, there was some patriotism, you know. Yeah. I got some really cool ones I can't fit in anymore that are American flags. Uh, the flag in my bedroom 
was actually uh, the funeral flag for an uncle of mine, that a veteran that died, and I ended up with the flag, and a, I wanted to block the windows out, so we'll start with this for background. You know, but a lot of hippies hung flags in their houses and shit, but a lot of right. them hung Vietnam flags and shit too, you know. We did a lot of stuff just to piss people off or blow their minds and stuff with, with, with the bad guys. But then I got another good band going with this really great guitar player who became my brother-in-law, but he got, our, just as we were breaking big in Milwaukee, he got rheumatoid arthritis, shrunk his fingers, he couldn't play no more. Another band, I thought, another band, you know. What was the name of that one? That was Icky Ricky and his poopy friends, because we wanted right. to get the most ridiculous name you could get. Nobody would forget that. We even got Eric. We had some, we got advertised, some bar was advertising us, and the DJs are just cracking up just reading that, you know. It was, we were having fun. When that broke up, that's when I, that's when I lost my mind and went full-time biker with the guys that I grew up with, you know. Then, then we were like hippie bikers and got in way over my head on that shit. The hippie thing... The politics didn't help. The Chicago riots and all that shit. But you were and down. Then, you were down there during the Democratic convention, were you not? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about it, or? I can tell you a lot about it, but. Well, if it's, we can get to it later. If that's better. Just do it later. We. That's a whole pretty good story in itself. Yeah. All this stuff was going on. You, did, you could pick your riot any week. You go to Madison, there'd be an anti-war riot. You can go to Milwaukee, there's going to be an open housing riot with the black people. You can go, there's going to be burn your draft card day down at Lake Park. You know, it's, it just riots all over the country. These were turmoil. Everybody says, you know, some are loving all that. <laughs> Shit, Milwaukee was under martial law for three days because of our riot. It, you know, we got the National Guard on the corner. That, and then Charlie Manson, with the Manson family, what they did, and, and saying that the Beatles were their influence to do all that shit, that just, that just, hippies were never popular, no matter what you see on the Netflix or documentaries now, his, we were just always a small minority. The hippies, the real hippies, the real acid heads that were on a spiritual quest that the music would help get you there, but the the goal was to to get there in your head, you know. Not to sit at a bar and say, look at the bar's going up and you know, but once the knuckleheads got a hold of acid, it got stupid. Then the Manson family gave us the hippies such bad pub relations. I mean, it just to be a hippie, people look at you and like, that, that's the image that came up. And then what, what really drove the final nail, I think, in it was when cocaine became popular and nobody had the patience to sit around and do a nice trip that would take you a weekend and a half maybe. It just, everybody wanted to, and just, you know, all that shit. So, the, yeah, but that's pretty important. You're saying you're, you're saying that uh, when it comes to using psychedelics in the beginning, it, I mean, no one thought it was a recreational activity. No, we would do it was like a sacrament. Right. And, and the, can you pass the acid test with Ken Kesey and them guys, the original hippies, you know, in San Francisco? That was that was a rite of initiation, and the Grateful Dead stuck with that, and they stayed with that trippy shit, and. Of course, you, it was so enjoyable, and the music sounded so great. But then, so did everything else. It just looked so great, and it, you, it just, you could finally get like the American uh, out of you, and just, ah, you know, that's what, yeah, it was. And if you were in a controlled circumstance, yeah, it sounds cliche, but the black light with some cool black light posters, and you put put Hendrix on it didn't have to be screaming loud you know or just something great and just get into it man that was that was that's all we wanted to do you know just 
smoke weed in the day, go walking around. But then all of a sudden, it, yeah, then this shit gets organized, and then it got commercialized, and then the drug, then it turned, like San Francisco, the thing died quick because, like, two million homeless kids just show up thinking it's going to be paradise down at Golden Gate Park, and, you know, at night, nobody's got food, they're getting diseases and shit. And then, uh, yeah, the coke thing, too, when... You can tell the music changed too. You can tell when the Stones got off the acid and went to the went to coke. You can tell between Satanic Majesties and Exile on Main Street just what happened. You know, you can hear that. Well, well one thing that I kind of have heard recently was this Captain Beefheart. Uh, he was singing about like old time religion. He's saying, "Say, give me this old time religion." And I just thought to myself, "Is he talking about dropping that, acid?" That, I mean, well, you know. That's just a cover of an ancient tune. That's yeah. a whole song. That I don't know what the hell he was singing. Yeah. That old time religion. Give me that old time religion. That, that's just nonsense. That's just an old folk tune. I don't think he was it's thinking enough. It's just a weird guy, I guess. Yeah, Captain Beefheart, that was an acquired taste. You know, yeah. And we didn't, to, to me and mine, if you couldn't dance to it, and if it didn't have some blues roots to it, it we just ignored it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's so much shit we ignored. And then, really quick, disc, all of a sudden, disco. Well, 1970 was actually was the end of an era because look who died in 1970, you know. And the Beatles broke up, and they were the, always the... The trendsetters musically in the studios, what they did in the studios was all. You got to remember all this stuff that I, all that vinyl there, that's when it came out. All these tunes that you guys love, I was here when they were new. And I'm, you, you get your mind blown every week because the new shit was coming out. So you're used to, I mean, we just love Jimi Hendrix, just over and over listen to it. Great shit in Buffalo Springfield. So Buffalo Springfield breaks up, the Beatles break up, Brian Jones dies, Jimi Hendrix dies, Morrison dies, Joplin dies. And then we're and what's the next guitar thing I'm supposed to listen to? Dun, 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 dun. Well a fifth grader could play that, you know, was thinking, what the f A C D C are you shitting me? We were a better band when we were in high school than them guys ever were, you know? That, that, that shit's just nonsense. And then disco all of a sudden. And uh, people I knew that I thought were just, just really hip. All of a sudden, they're walking around with John Travolta doing, what is this, all just a fashion trend? You know, it got really depressing as fast as the true hippie thing went away. Now... The deadheads kept that going as 